to our Palm Sunday service on this damp uh, but warm Sunday morning. We're happy to have you here as we begin Holy Week leading up to Easter next Sunday. I have a few announcements I'd like to share as we get started. Uh, first, I'm sure you've heard of the passing of Betty Evers on Friday evening. Uh, there will be a visitation night here at the church on Wednesday from 5 to 8 p.m., and that would be followed by a uh, service here on Thursday afternoon at 2, and then a graveside service at Calvary. Uh, the family invites you if you're able to attend, and please keep uh, Betty and Gary, Rhonda, and Amy, and their families uh, in your prayers. Also, we'll be having an Easter egg hunt next Saturday the 3rd at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, for our church family as well as for the children throughout our community. Please be here if you can and spread the word. Uh, the men's group will meet tonight at 6.30. If you're able to help with some yard work uh, for an elderly member of our community, please see Fred Taylor. And please keep Martha Jane Lavender in your prayers as she'll be having a bit of surgery this week. Uh, lastly, we'll be having our Good Friday service uh, this coming Friday at 7 o'clock. So please try to be here for that. Sue, do you have anything? Just a couple of things. Um, creative worship team meets tonight at 7. Our friend of the week is Ola May Coffee. Please remember her. Um, we still need some candies and so forth to fill our Easter eggs. The team, the, uh, the family ministry team is going to meet on uh, Tuesday, this coming Tuesday at 7 here at the church to get um, do final plans for Saturday's Easter egg hunt. Uh, so if you can make some donations of those candies, we'd appreciate it. Um, also, we have some flyers there that the team asked if you can pick some up and pass them around the community, um, post them a few places this week. That would be great help to us. There are some flyers in the back, vestibule, and some up here on the uh, front row. Um, I think that's it. And uh, we'll begin worship this morning by hearing a video uh, by our worship orchestra down at the cross.
Father, we thank you for the life you've given us to live, for the sun rising to start another day, and for the reminders of your creation that surround us. When we witness a beautiful mark of your creative hand, let us remember that Christ was with you too when the world began and the sound of your voice. He came to earth and watched the same sunrise we now see. He looked into the stars and now looks down upon us prayerfully with love. With grateful hearts, we praise you, God, for who you are and who we are in you. Let the peace of Christ, Palm Sunday entrance, remain in us. When we are fearful and anxious, help us to recall the peace in which Jesus rode into the city so soon to be crucified. God, our Father, help us to act in grace and peace in the face of fear, both known and unknown, knowing you are incredibly close. For we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. As we consider the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, our praise team shares a video, a song entitled, The Nails in Your Hand.
Would you follow along with our responsive reading printed in your bulletins? I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim with me the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty for everything in the heavens and on the earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of everything. In your hand are the power and might, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. Lord my God, you have done many things, your wonderful works and your plans for us. None can compare with you. If I were to report and speak of them, they are more than can be told. Lord, your name endures forever. Your reputation, Lord, through all generations. Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. And one more video that reads into Billy's message this morning to us. Uh, written by uh, Rick Saxog, and we sh uh, usually share it close to Easter time every year, called Who Is This Man? Who is this man? To spread the word of love Who preaches to five thousand Of his kingdom of Who is this man? Who claims to be the Lord Who walks among the sinners Who feeds in the poor Who is this man? Easter. It's been a long winter, 
hasn't it? Just grinding. Uh, there are times in life when all you feel like you can do is just put your head down and take one step at a time. Just try to keep going. That's what this winter's felt like for most of us. But this week, I drove with the windows down. And this week, the birds started singing right around 7 in the morning. And I started thinking about cutting the grass. And I took the dog out close to 8 in the evening and didn't need to turn the porch light on. Spring is here, according to the calendar. Everything is becoming new again. And with that comes a sense of hope, a sense of renewing. Easter. Today is Palm Sunday, and that's a story in the Gospels that often gets mentioned this time of year, but it's rarely dwelled upon. There's almost a checklist of Easter things for preachers to cover. You have to talk about Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter Sunday, and that's just the Easter story as a whole. The problem, though, that we can all run into as Christians is that we've heard these stories over and over. It's almost like the Nativity story at Christmas. We've heard it so many times that it's hard to see it with fresh eyes. And today I'd like to talk about Palm Sunday with an aim to see it with fresh eyes. This is the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's the first major event of his last week on earth. But this story that's so familiar on the surface is also so deeply filled with symbolism about who Jesus is and what he came to do. It shows him as both the savior of the world and the teacher of us all. Read with me from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And this is God's word. If you look at this scripture and really dig down into it, you'll find that Jesus is being very deliberate in everything he does here. Christ never did anything without a reason. Every action he took and word he said carried a deeper meaning. And you won't find many places in the gospel where that's more true than this one. Jesus is carefully choosing exactly how this scene unfolds because it's deeply symbolic. He's trying to teach us three things about who he is and what his purpose is. And it's this. He's a savior who will confront us. A king who will confuse us and a Lord who is coming for us. This passage tells us something about each of these three features of Christ. Let's take a look at them one at a time. First, he's a savior who will confront us. If you look back through the beginning and the middle of Jesus' ministry, you'll find the same pattern being repeated over and over. Jesus will heal someone of some terrible condition or disease, and then he'll say what? Don't tell anybody. Same thing every time. He might say something like, go show, your, go show yourself to the priest, but don't tell anybody else. Don't tell anybody what I've done for you. And that seems strange on the surface, doesn't it? Because if you're starting out a ministry and you're the savior of the world, wouldn't you want people to be talking about the things you can do? Word of mouth would mean everything, right? That was true then and it's true now. But here's Jesus healing people and performing miracles and saying, shh, 
He's trying to limit what people say about him publicly. All through that part of his ministry, Jesus is preaching and performing miracles. He's telling parables. He's healing the blind and deaf and lame. He's telling his disciples that he's the Messiah. But he's trying to keep word of that from spreading among the people. Why is that? Because the more people make these great claims about him, the more pressure is going to be put on the religious and the political leaders to stop him. If Jesus is going around preaching and teaching and spreading the gospel, that's one thing. But if he's performing one miracle after another and people are telling everybody about his power, and if word starts spreading that the Messiah has come, then the authorities are going to be pushed to arrest him at best. Or worse, kill him. Because then he's more than a prophet, isn't he? Then he becomes a threat to their power. Jesus couldn't let that happen just yet. It wasn't time. He had a lot more to do. But that changes right here as he's coming into Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 20, right before this, we have a very short but meaningful interaction between Jesus and two blind men. Jesus and his disciples are leaving Jericho, heading toward Jerusalem, and a great crowd is following them. Two blind men are standing by the roadside, and when they hear that Jesus is passing, they cry out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Son of David. You know what that's a term for? That's a term for the Messiah. The crowd rebukes them. It says, be quiet. But the men cry out even louder. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus stops. He asks the two men what they want him to do, and they answer that they want their eyes to be opened. So Jesus heals them of their blindness, and the two men follow him. But you know what Jesus never says here? He never says, don't tell anybody. That's all over. No more keeping quiet about things. The time has come for everybody to know who Jesus is. And now as Jesus and the disciples and this huge crowd come near Jerusalem, Jesus sends two of the disciples on. Verse 2, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Everybody else is walking into Jerusalem. Jesus Rides it. Now, for the first time, he's publicly placing himself above the rest of the people. He's showing them that he's somebody far more powerful, far more important, far more influential. Word of his coming spreads. The crowds that are walking with him into Jerusalem are met with more crowds of people coming out of Jerusalem, wanting to meet him, wanting to, wanting to take part in this, wanting to welcome Christ in. Verse 8, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. They're welcoming Jesus, not as a prophet, as the Messiah. Verse 9, and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. We say that word a lot at Easter time, don't we? We sing that word and we pray that word, but do you know what that word means? You know what Hosanna is translated as? It's not Lord. It's not Messiah. It means save us. Verse 9 is a direct call to Psalm 118.25. Save us, we pray. O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. And then in verses 12 through 17, Jesus goes into the temple and overturns the tables of the money changers, cleansing it of sin. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Did you catch that? What's he say? My house. He's calling the temple his house. And the only person, the only person who can call a place my house is who? The owner. And if Jesus is calling the temple his house, that can only mean one thing. He's God. In both of these cases, coming into Jerusalem and cleansing the, te the temple, what's Jesus doing? He's publicly saying that he's the Messiah. He is the true king. And he's telling the political and the religious leaders of Jerusalem that they're either going to have to crown him or kill him. Can't be both. Can't be neither. You're going to have to do one or the other. And, if you, if, and you can't read about Jesus in the Gospels without hearing him say the same thing to us. What are you going to do with me? He asked you. 
Are you going to crown me? Are you going to kill me? Am I your Lord or am I a fraud? He's pushing the envelope here. He's saying to the authorities, worship me or murder me. And he's saying to us, you can give me everything and make me your Lord or you can ignore me. But don't just like me. Don't just call me a good man or a great moral teacher. You can run from me or you can worship me, but you cannot just like me. Because you see, you can't separate Christ from who he is. You can't do that to anybody. If Kathy told me right now, Billy Coffey, I want you to go sit down because I'm tired of hearing you, and she might, I could do that. I could just go sit down. But if Kathy said, I want the Billy part to go sit down, but I want the coffee part to stay up here on the stage, I can't do that. I'm not two parts. I'm a whole. You get all of me or you get nothing. Same with Jesus. You have to give him everything and make him the center of your life. You can't say, I'll obey this, but not that. You can't say, I want the Savior, but I don't want the Lord. You get him all or you get nothing. That's why he's the king of confrontation, because that's the choice he forces you to make. That's what Palm Sunday means. But he's also a king who will confuse you if you're not careful. We've talked about this a few times before, how often we'll have this picture in our heads of what God's supposed to be like and what God's supposed to do, but that's not how God ends up looking like or doing. Our expectations of God don't always line up with the reality of God, and the result is, at the very least, confusion. At the most, the result can be a loss of faith. We're so sure that God's going to do something. He's going to heal that disease or he's going to fix this situation. He's either going to let something happen or he's going to keep something from happening. And then he doesn't. God ends up doing the exact opposite of what we think he should do. We see that time and again in Jesus' life. All through the Gospels we find that people are trying to fit Jesus into a box. And time and again he refuses to be put in one. We see that in this passage as well, and it's all centered around what Jesus rides into Jerusalem on. A donkey and a colt. Now we have to talk about this, because how could Jesus be riding two animals here? Well, listen, because this is important. First, there's a practical reason for this. You have to remember, this was a long journey that Jesus took. The donkey would have been stronger and more able to navigate the terrain on the way to Jerusalem, but her colt, the young donkey who had never been ridden, would be able to bring him into the city easily. But again, Jesus is being symbolic here as well. The donkey and colt represent the Jews who were used to the yoke of the law and the Gentiles represented by the colt. Jesus rode both into Jerusalem to show that both Jews and Gentiles would be united under his spiritual rule. But there's even more going on here, and it's all about what a king of that time would do and how he would act after a great victory. The Roman emperors would return to Rome after a great victory on the battlefield and be greeted with a spectacle unlike any we would ever see. All the people would line the streets, shouting admiration. There would be music and pomp and circumstance. Armies would line up to salute him. The emperor would be pulled by a stallion and a chariot. And the whole scene would be so over the top, so extravagant, that a slave would always ride in the chariot behind the emperor. And that slave's single job was to whisper in his master's ear over and over again, you're only a mortal. Even in Israel, this would happen. 200 years before Jesus rode into Jerusalem, a man named Simon Maccabeus had defeated an invading army and kept Israel free. He rode into Jerusalem on a fierce horse with people shouting cheers and waving branches because he had delivered them. But Jesus isn't riding on a fierce horse, is he? He's riding on a donkey. That's kind of comical. Really, isn't it? He's turning everything on its head. It's a very deliberate choice. And we see, and we see in verse 4, it's actually the fulfillment of a prophecy from Zechariah. Jesus isn't coming into Jerusalem as a conqueror, not a victor. Certainly not as the sort of king that people would expect. 
Why is he making this triumphal entry by arriving in such a gentle way? Because he's telling us something about himself and something about us. Jesus isn't coming in to rule. He's coming in to save. And he's not coming to save by taking power and by killing. He's coming to save by losing power and dying. He's going to triumph through weakness so that his followers, you and me, can come to salvation only by repenting and admitting our needs. And that is so important. We're not saved by our good works. We're not saved by a strong Savior, at least not in the sense that we think of strength. Jesus didn't say, look at how I live my life, look at how moral and good I am, and then you live in the exact same way because that's how you get to heaven. That's what a lot of people think, and they're wrong. Jesus didn't say, do good works and be like me, because that would only mean salvation would be for the strong. And a lot of people, most people, me, are not strong. That's why salvation is so dependent on grace. It's free in spite of our sins. It's free because we're weak. It doesn't make much sense. It could be a little confusing if we're not careful because it's certainly not how we would expect an all-powerful and all-holy God to act. But it's how a loving God would act. Because a grace that's free is a grace that allows anyone anyone to reach heaven but here's the point about us too here's where god most often confuses us or to put it more exactly here's where we most often get confused about god what is this crowd welcoming jesus into jerusalem what what are they expecting because they have to be expecting something from him right we all go to god expecting something we all go to god because we think we need something we all go to God and say, you need to give me exactly what I think I need from you. These people lie in the streets of Jerusalem. What did they think they needed from God? They were shouting, save us. But save us from what? From the Romans. They needed God to bring judgment on their oppressors when what they really needed was someone who could bear the judgment for their own sins. They thought the Romans were ruining the world, when in fact their own sins were ruining the world just as much. They were thinking of the now. God was thinking of eternity. They were thinking about the end of Roman rule. He was thinking about the need to bridge the gap between heaven and earth so that Christ could return one day and put an end to evil without putting an end to you and me. That disconnect of what we think we need from God and what God knows we need from him is exactly why, right here, people are waving palm branches and laying down their cloaks, but in a few days they're going to turn away. That disconnect is exactly why in this passage people are shouting, Hosanna, but in a few pages those same people will be shouting, crucify him. Palm Sunday is the perfect story of the constant struggle we all face between what we think we need and what God provides us. What we think we need is almost always shallow. What God knows we need is always deep. That's why God will always exceed our expectations in the long run, but the short run can often look very confusing. Remember that when you come to him in faith, he will always give you what you need, but he will often confuse you in the way that he does it, and he will always exceed your expectations in the end. Remember this, because this is so very important. God always gives you exactly what you would have asked for if you knew everything he knows. If you learn that, if you keep that one point in mind, then you're going to live a contented life. If you don't learn this, then you'll always be struggling with it. We'll always come to God with those needs that are right on the surface. He'll always respond by going straight at the root. So Jesus will always be a king who confronts us by making us choose whether to fall down and worship him or walk away from him. And he'll always be a king who confuses us so long as we see him as a God who only provides for the moment instead of for eternity. And lastly, he's the coming king. The crowd thought Jesus was coming to put everything right on earth, to put 
down all the injustice and suffering that they lived with every day. But that wasn't the case. He wasn't coming to put things right on earth. He was coming to put you right with God. This passage looks ahead to Christ's second coming in two different ways. First, let's look at why today is called Palm Sunday. The crowd did more than place their cloaks on the road for Jesus to ride over as he came into Jerusalem. They also cut branches from palm trees and laid them out or waved them as he passed. What does this mean? We get a glimpse of that in Psalm 96. Listen to Psalm 96, verses 10 through 13. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the, Lord, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. What's that passage of scripture about? It's about a new beginning. It's about making things right. About restoration, both of the earth and of ourselves. These people are waving palm branches in the same way that Psalm 96 says, the trees will be singing. Isaiah says in chapter 56 of his book that the trees of the field will be clapping their hands. The blessedness that the people of Jerusalem are asking for from the Messiah is the same blessedness that will accompany Christ back to earth. When the true king comes back and puts everything right, nature will work perfectly again. It will be the end of sickness, the end of violence, the end of want. Everything that's wrong with the material world will be fixed. Everything will be as it was meant to be. But you see, the only way Jesus can return to earth that way without destroying everything, including you and me, was if he rode into Jerusalem not as a conquering king, but as a sacrifice. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't have to ride in Jerusalem that way. He didn't have to endure any of the suffering that he faced. At any moment, he could have called to heaven and had 10,000 angels at his side. He wasn't weak. You think a weakling could have walked into the temple? And chased out the money changers? Turned over all those tables? No. And remember how he's coming into the city. He's not walking. He's riding a young donkey. A young donkey. That's important because that means Jesus is riding an animal who hasn't been broken yet. Can you imagine trying to ride a wild donkey through the streets of a city? Imagine doing that with all those people shouting. From a human perspective, nobody could do this. But under the hands of a Messiah who controls nature itself, a Messiah who can command even the winds and the storms, that animal, that wild animal, is at peace. And this points right to the peace that's going to come over everything when he returns. Jesus is the Lord of all, but he's a Lord that rules not with an iron fist, but with love. Everything under his control possesses nothing but harmony and peace. The donkey isn't just a donkey. He's the symbol of all the healing and completion that nature will undergo when Christ returns. So let me ask you this. Is that what you believe? Today is the start of what's known as Holy Week to Christians all over the planet. And whether we've accepted Christ as our Savior or we've never known him, we all ask the same question as the people of Jerusalem. This passage says the whole city was stirred up. People everywhere asking, who is this? That's exactly what you have to answer. That's what Jesus forces us all to confront. Who am I? Am I your savior or am I just a good teacher? Am I your Lord or am I just the God you ask for things from? Do you want me to fix your circumstances right now or do you want me to get you ready for eternity? Do you want to come with me with your hand out or with your heart out? That's what you need to be thinking about this week. Revel in Easter. Yes, absolutely. Find joy in what this season means. 
But in the midst of all that, I want you to take a good look at Jesus as he is, instead of Jesus as you want him to be. Let him confront you. Let him demand to know what you think of him. Let him make you prove the place that he has in your life. And if it's not the place it should be, then you better get started fixing it. Let him confuse you. Don't shy away from those times when Jesus doesn't make any sense. Don't hide. Don't run away from him. Run right to him. Because it's when you don't think that he's there that he's never been closer to you. And it's when you think he's turned away that he's staring right into your face saying, I love you and you are mine and there is nothing in heaven or on earth that will ever snatch you from my hand. Because he's coming. He is. I don't know when and you don't either. And that doesn't matter. He said he's coming back. He's coming. He said, I'm going to set things right. He will. He said, I'm going to fix everything in you that's torn. And I'm going to repair everything in creation that's broken. And it will all happen so quickly and so completely that you won't be able to contain your joy. And that's exactly what will happen. He didn't ride into Jerusalem to the place of his death as a conquering king. But I guarantee you that's exactly how he's going to return. And if you don't know that king, but you want to, I invite you to come up here as our closing hymn plays. Let's pray. Father, Palm Sunday is a reminder of the unexpected yet fully anticipated king of kings. Jesus didn't look like the Messiah your people hoped for. The way he entered the holy city on that day, riding a young donkey as a sign of peace and fulfillment of prophecy, didn't match with their expectations of a military conqueror. Much of our daily lives don't align with our expectations of you either, Father. So much of our lives don't make sense. This Palm Sunday, though, let us embrace the unexpected entrance of our Savior, Jesus. Let us apply this incredible truth to our lives. He came to bring us peace. He is peace. Father, how quickly we forget the peace we possess in Christ. Remind us minute by minute as we navigate these difficult days and trying times. Father, we need peace to live life to the full as Jesus died for us to live. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. We invite you to stand as we close our hymn. preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the love of God go with us this day and forever. Amen. Have a good week, everyone.